Do you want to wait a few more minutes, Kathy? Or I, um, I was... Well, maybe, maybe we can start and I'll just um, welcome everyone and Brian can continue to admit people. Um, right. Good evening, everyone. Um, as you can see, we are admitting people one by one. Um, and we do have a chat room and the chat room, you can send questions if you want to, to the hosts, which is the UNESCO team. I'm Kathy Shane. I'm chair of the elementary school building committee. And we are the sponsors of tonight's uh, forum. And this is the second forum of which there will be future forums, but this is basically giving you a status report of where we are right now in the school building project. And I am going to turn the entire meeting over to Margaret Wood, who is our owner's project manager from Answer First, and then to, to Donna Donesco to present to you what we found and what the next steps are going to be on this incredibly exciting project. And I want to thank everyone who's here tonight, um, including I see our state rep, Mindy Dom is with us and she has been with us faithfully. And Mindy, thank you very much. And we have several counselors with us. In addition to me, I'm on the council. So I think with that, I am going to welcome everyone and turn the meeting over to, I think Margaret is our first speaker, Margaret. Can you unmute yourself, Margaret? No, Brian. Margaret. Okay. Oh, there you go. There we go. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening. I'm going to just um, provide some uh, timeline context before we launch into the main presentation. So um, we're participating, this project is participating in a process that is um, driven by. Um, achieving uh, funding from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, the MSBA, which you'll hear mentioned a number of times tonight. And they have certain steps that we need to go through. You could think of them as the bank. So they have requirements for our process. And um, here on the screen, if you can see it, um, this outlines the three major steps in the process. Um, the one that we are just completing, which is just to the left of the we are here line is what's called the preliminary design program. And Donna's really gonna go into detail about what, it, what encapsulates the preliminary design program and what we have learned in that process. But it is setting the stage for the next step, which is called the preferred schematic report. Together, those two pieces are part of what the MSBA calls module three, which you'll see at the bottom. And the next stage, I think, is really the piece that we know everyone's uh, really dying to dive into, which is trying to figure out what the option is, what the, what the preferred option is that is going to be the basis of the detailed design and the funding agreement. So the one thing I'll say about this diagram is, so we're about to launch into that second step, the preferred schematic report. Um, we expect that process to end in June. We have to make a submission to the Massachusetts School Building Authority on June 27th. So over the next three months, there are going to be a lot of meetings that are sort of going to dive into these options that Donna is going to summarize tonight, or the alternatives, as the MSBA calls them. Then in the fall, the design team will be doing this, what's called the schematic design, which is you could think of as the first detailed design step. The purpose of it is to develop enough detail to establish a price, which can be the basis of a funding agreement for a, build, for a project that will then go through at least another year of design and most likely two plus years of construction. So um, that's the context. I'm going to turn it back to Donna to really dive into and summarize what we've learned in the PDP process. Great, thank you. Um, my name's Donna Danisco. Uh, many of you look are familiar, and there are some new folks. So welcome this evening. Uh, we have our design team with us. Just would like to quickly acknowledge Rick. Just everyone can just wave. Rick Rice, Tim Cooper, as I see them. Vivian Lowe, Colin Finch, 
And there's a man behind the curtain, Brian. So we'll just, <laughs> he does exist. All right. So um, with that, that that's um, the, the team that's been working closely with the school district, the town. And it's really been a very vibrant, wonderful and engaging process to date. And we are sure that this will continue. And I mean that sincerely. Um, the more interaction and, and hearing what your goals are for a project, the, the better the project will be. So we really truly appreciate all of your input. So as, as Margaret mentioned, uh, this is really the culmination of the preliminary design program. Uh, we, we actually are very excited to say we have uh, an approved educational program. We have understood all of the existing conditions. We've talked a lot about those earlier. So tonight, we're just going to give you a quick update on those. We have established some basis of the design parameters. You know, we understand it needs to be a net zero school. We understand a lot of the educational goals, the architectural goals. So those have been built into the costing exercise that we've done. Um, and then, and then really what we need to do is, and we have done, is to develop and evaluate alternatives. They're concepts, they're not designs. I, I just, it's really important to note, I know there are drawings, so there's, you know, it's hard to believe that, that these are not designs, but they're not, they're really just concepts. And the purpose of the PDP is to identify viable options to develop further, or to say it differently, these are test fits and those that didn't meet the educational or architectural or site requirements, we want to discard those so that we can focus on the viable options going forward. So Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Just talk about the existing, the traffic study. Um, this is a brief overview of the first step of the traffic study that is being conducted with the project. The first step is to gather information on the sites, how traffic is currently working. And then as we go through the process, we're going to analyze how traffic changes based on the design will affect traffic close to the site and evaluate how traffic moves on the site with a larger enrollment. But at this point, we're just talking about what is there currently. Um, so starting with the Fort River School, um, there are long driveways that allow vehicle queuing, both cars and buses that are in the process of picking up and dropping off to stack entirely on site. That is not to say that there is not some conflict at the entrances. Uh, especially at the north, where there is an intersection with Main Street, that there can be some backups. But in general, all of the queues are accommodated on site, which is a very good thing. Um, traffic is separated, which is nice. Both parent and drop off and buses are at different points. But on site, the two traffic patterns sometimes conflict, which requires uh, management, but it is appropriately staffed. And then the comment on signs on the site. The site is well signed, but it could be better. Um, this mentions the manual and uniform traffic control devices, which are the standard for signs. So um, there are a lot of signs on site that just have text instead of the crosswalk symbols that everyone recognizes. It's just an added layer of safety that is instantly recognizable for people that may not be familiar with the site, even though most of the people who are picking up and dropping off are. So on the other potential site, the Wildwood site, there is still driveway and the queues for drop off and pick up are accommodated on site, but because there is only one entrance to the site, unlike Fort River, there's a little more crossing traffic, which causes backups on Strong Street. Again, at Wildwood, bus traffic and car traffic at the point of drop off is ideal, but there are some crossing patterns on site that potentially can be mitigated or improved with a new design for the site. Um, here we go to an uh, image of Fort River that just shows bus traffic in yellow and car traffic in blue. You can see the crossing area at the southern end of the building where a thing has become, I won't say difficult, I, I will say that our traffic engineer said that these two schools are some of the best run uh, elementary drop off situations that he's seen, but everything can be improved. So that traffic, that crossing traffic pattern there, drop offs that happen opposite active parking are all things that could be minimized or eliminated in a design. 
And if we want to move to the Wildwood site. So here we see the Wildwood site with a single entrance, which creates more crossing traffic patterns on site where the buses and parent drop off after that. And then with that single entrance with cars and buses making turns in both directions coming in and out of the site, uh, there is queuing that happens and traffic disruption on Strong Street. So that is the state of traffic at pick up and drop off now. And as we get into the designs of the site, we will be looking to improve those conditions with better traffic flow on the sites. Thank you, Tim. So as we started accumulating information, this, this really was an information gathering um, part of the project. We had several visioning sessions, both with the staff and with the community. And the, a lot of the same goals resonated both with the staff and the community. And just to highlight a couple, uh, you know, student-centered and experiential learning. And the experiment, experiential learning just continues um, all the way down. Collaborative and inter interdisciplinary STEAM and project-based learning all of these are exper experiential, as well as outdoor learning experiences, all the way down to innovation and engagement. And of course, dual language in the Comanantes program is very important. And then teaching um, our students to be, you know, uh, stewards of our of our um, climate will be really wonderful as they're now learning um, in real time what that what the climate what we've done to the climate and how we can improve upon it and then we talked about architectural goals so we have the educational goals and and those are you know for teaching and learning how do those translate to architectural goals and how can the building inform and shape the space so that you can um, meet those teaching goals or learning goals so again, similar patterns here, innovative, inspiring, and inclusive, right? Collaborative spaces, outdoor learning with connections to the outdoors. And then again, sustainability, we know this will be a net zero uh, building or school. And then safety, security, environmental quality, and then always flexibility. Flexibility for the building will be with you for 50 plus years. So we want to think about how this building can remain flexible as educational um, programming changes throughout the years, but also forward thinking about, we've just come off of the, the you know, COVID virus and, and we wanna to try to anticipate, although no one ever could have anticipated that, but again, just keeping in mind the flexibility of the building, which is gonna be so important. So the educational program, like I said, the school committee voted last night to support the educational plan and also the spaces that support the educational plan. The program identifies all of the programs offered district-wide. It identifies the programs to be offered within the new, we're saying it's quote unquote new renovation addition or new school. It then also helps inform the spatial relationships and adjacencies, which are gonna be important as we start to lay out the building and what, how that will shape the building. And then of course, the program defines the space needs and total square footage of the project. We have two enrollment options that we need to study for MSBA, Mass School Building Authority. The first one, because the SOI was based on the Fort River Elementary School, they want to see what the cost would be for a Fort River Elementary School only. So it's a grades K through five, it was K through six, but the district has voted to move the sixth grade to the middle school. So they've adjusted the enrollment to 165 students. And then the second option is a combined Fort River and Wildwood School for grades K through five with an enrollment of 575 students. So the very first step is we're trying to identify the space needs is we need to understand the class size policies and the school committee has outlined class size policies as you can see up at the top for kindergarten through first grade, second and third, and then fourth through sixth grade. So we take the total, num the total enrollment that we've agreed to with MSBA, we divide it over the six grades, 
we take the class size policy or the number of students in a classroom, and then we divide that into the number of students in the grade, which will arrive at how many classes we need for each grade with the total number of classes for the entire school or classrooms, general classrooms. We bring this up for Fort River um, only. We, we recognize that for the Fort River School of 165 students does not meet your educational goals and it really is not a viable option, but we will have to go through the exercise to demonstrate to MSBA that we have looked at it. It doesn't make sense from an educational or cost-effective, um, just doesn't make sense. So we are gonna go through that exercise, but I just want to point that out to you. But for the combined Fort River and Wildwood schools, again, taking 575 divided by all of the six grades with the average class size per classroom, Turns out that we need five classrooms per grade for a total of 30 classrooms. And that will be the focus as we start talking about this. But the general classrooms really are only a part of the story and all of the space needs that we need to, to fully um, educate our students. And I know I see many familiar names, so I know you've heard this and even some folks have, have actively or have listened in on the school committee uh, meetings. And so I apologize, some of this is redundant, but it's important to note the school committee approved and voted last night to accept a total program area of 70,500 feet net floor area. That's the spaces inside the building. And I just like to quickly highlight all of the program components. So the general classrooms are part of the core academic spaces, which is a total of 35,000 and 50 net floor areas. It includes five classrooms per grade. It supports the ELL program. There's a STEM or STEAM space involved, uh, included in this, as well as Title I and other support spaces. Special education is 12,100 uh, net floor area. That includes all of the specialized programs, OTPT, speech and language, the learning centers, all of the support spaces, including the mental health requirements for the students. For art and music, we'll have a dedicated art room and a dedicated music room, as well as practice rooms. If there's a need for some overflow, we've built in flexibility where the art, if, if the art requires a, a second classroom for a couple of periods, the steam room is available for that. For the music, we've identified that we can design the cafetorium that that could be used for music as well. For the health and PE, which is really the gym and the support spaces, storage and the PE teacher's office, originally the conversation was um, 6,000 square feet. And that is what is a typical elementary school gym. But in lots of conversations with the district school committee, people felt that 4,000 square feet is adequate for your educational program. Would it be nice? It would be nice to have a 6,000 square foot gym, but we recognize the importance of keeping the total square footage of the building down as much as possible while providing the appropriate level of spaces for the education of the students. The 4,000 square foot gym will accommodate your educational needs and will even provide additional space to support other uses of it simultaneously. The media center or library is 30 is 3200 3258 net floor area. And the dining is comprised of a cafetorium, as I mentioned, it will be a cafeteria. And then we'll have a stage in there, a platform so that you can have assembly use. It also includes a kitchen and teacher dining. The medical and admin um, spaces account for a little over 3000 net floor area, and then the custodial maintenance, um, which we'll always say is never enough, but we're following MSBA guidelines. So it's 2,175. So the total program area that was voted and supported last night is 70,500. That's just the program. So now we have to get around the building. We need circulation. We need corridors and hallways. We need bathrooms. We need mechanical spaces. 
We need other storage. These are non-program areas and spaces within the building. This even includes the thickness of the walls. So what we do is we take a multiplier of 1.5 on the total program area, which will arrive at 105,750. Our, our, commit, our commitment to you is we will not exceed that amount. That is MSBA's maximum amount that they will reimburse upon. So that our commitment to you is that we will not exceed that. Our goal would make it more efficient, but there's all, there increasingly has become more and more needs such as gender neutral bathrooms, which take up more space. So we will continue to refine this, but our commitment to you is we would not exceed this square footage. So as we take the program, if we now start putting it together to understand what the spatial relationships are. What I'd like to note is we did this diagram um, before last night. We haven't had time to update it. So what you'll see is we actually still have two music rooms and now there'll only be one. The gym is the size of 6,000 square feet and now it will be 4,000. So we'll refine this, but really it's the concept and the visual. And that's what we need to understand the spatial relationships, the core academic and special ed are in purple. And then we have other academic spaces that can also be utilized for community use. So we wanna just start thinking about what can be used for community use, what can be used and, and what areas will we do not want the community to have access to. So from here, it really starts shaping the building. Right. How is this going to lay out in a manner that's the most efficient, right, to keep our gross square footage down, but also to maximize the time on learning for the students. Placing spaces adjacent to each other, either vertically or horizontally, is going to be really important to maximize the time on learning for the students so they don't have to wander from one end of the building to the other just to get a space. The integration of special ed is critically important. So we'll be spending a lot of time making sure that those spaces are within their um, the grade level peers and the appropriate locations for those spaces. So I don't know if anyone has any questions related to the square footage or um, anything, but if anyone has any questions, you can either raise your hand or the co-hosts can see some chat. I haven't seen anything yet, but I thought I'd pause here to see if anyone has any questions. Okay. So with that, I will continue. So uh, Donna, yes, you have one question. I do. Okay. And the question is, why do gender neutral bathrooms take more space? Thank you. Um, so gender, typically with, for boys and girls, we have uh, multi-stall bathrooms. So it's for oversight and it's also for safety and security of the students and it's the most efficient. Gender neutral bathrooms require their own individual bathroom, which we understand they, they may not identify with the girls or the boys. And so the, uh, what we do now is we create gender neutral bathrooms. So these students feel that comfortable utilizing bathroom. So we haven't had a full conversation about those and where those may be located, but that has become a very common um, new add to the, to the um, layout of the buildings and inclusion of the buildings. Were there any other questions, Brian? No, no, not at this time. Okay. And then I think the only other thing I want to point out is um, that the gender, the code, mass code requires boys and girls, men and women. And so these are in addition to the code requirements that we must meet. Oh, I went ahead of myself. So Again, we, we have one spent- one more question, Donna. Thank you. Sorry. I don't know, um, I'm not seeing them. Uh, it, does the program include lactation rooms or showers for teachers? 
It does not include showers for teachers. Thank you for asking. Um, we understand the needs of um, female teachers and we'll be working with um, the district to determine how we can address that important requirement or need. These are great questions. We haven't heard these before. Oh, Mindy has her hand up. Brian, can you? Yes, and uh, what Mindy was asking was to uh, remain informed about the bathroom issue because uh, she has legislation about this at the state house. Oh, love it. Thank you. Yes. Yes, this has been a challenging topic. So thank you. Whatever you can do to support it would be great. Okay, so are my eyes saying no more questions? Okay, Mindy, did you have one more question? Okay, great. Um, so as we started to say at the beginning, um, we've developed plans or alternatives that really are test fits. It really is just to determine that these alternatives meet or don't meet your educational needs and that they fit on the sites. And so while they look pretty, um, I'll give credit to my team, they're, they're not done. Um, they're really just concepts and test fits. So what we have here is the Fort River School um, on, on the site. And uh, we, this is a renovation addition and it will be approximately 108,000 square feet. Uh, we have not fully vetted all the spatial relationships and adjacencies, that's the next phase. But with, our experience and background, we understood the need to keep class grade level classrooms together, make sure the community spaces are together, et cetera. So we will explore this in more detail going forward, but this is a test fit to say, yes, this works. It seems to work on the site. So what I'd like to point out, um, just a few things. So what's in white is the existing building and where it says renovated Fort River School, what we would do is, is demolish the interior of the building so that we can actually provide natural light and daylighting into all of the spaces that are in white. Right now you have the library right in the middle. The spaces just really are not conducive nor do they provide natural light where they should. And then we would have a two-story addition. With that said, and similar to what's going to what you'll see at the Wildwood site because they're identical schools, we are providing the same number of parking adequate to support the staff that have been identified. We've been able to identify locations for play spaces. Um, it's most likely going to have two different types of play spaces for the younger grades and the older grades. They will be completely. Um, designed for universal access. So all students will be able to access them. They'll just have different structures for different grade levels. We have access all the way around the building um, for, for emergency vehicles. Well, again, I, as I mentioned, we have the parking and then we've identified a geothermal. So recognize this is gonna be a net zero building. We wanted to start with geothermal. We're continuing to explore, is it gonna be geothermal, which is ground source air um, heat, or if it's gonna be air source heat. And we'll be working with the net zero committee and the building committee um, over the next couple of months to identify what makes the most sense for the community. But recognizing that geothermal takes up space, we wanted to make sure that that remained an option and going forward. So we've identified a geothermal field based on an assumed square footage, which we're comfortable with at 108,000 square feet, um, trying to target a, 30, a 25 EUI for the building. That's the goal from a net zero perspective, that this will have about 80 to 100 wells. We have yet to fully vet this, but that is an order of magnitude required. But you're seeing lots of dots here, but we just want you to know those, those are going 500 feet in the ground and we'll have um, soil that will cover them so that it can be utilized for play fields, for parking, for um, any other kind of site amenities that we want. 
we remain the two access drives um, that are currently there and we'll continue to study that as we go forward. Our goal is to maximize the queuing on site and minimize the traffic and the queuing on the main roads. I also wanna point out that as you can see, the amount of construction that would occur, here's the building, then we need the geothermal. We have all of the parking that would need to be um, re replaced. And we have the contractor that's going to require site access. He has lay down space. He's going to need areas for, for his uh, activities and work. So it is very safe to say that the entire site that's highlighted in, in light green, not, not in the trees, we are, are being um, respectful of the wetlands and our boundaries to the east, that all of this site is going to be disturbed during construction. It's the same um, on Wildwood, but clearly there's a lot less to be disturbed. But for the renovation and new construction on Fort River, we understand and want everyone to understand is the site's pretty much gonna be disturbed. So we need to replace it. So right now it's, uh, we are just stating that, you know, an assumption we've made, which has not been fully vetted with the community, is that we are gonna replace the fields in kind the best that we can and as they fit on the site. This does impact site costs and I'm sure many of you have seen it, but it's, it's to improve the fields. We understand they're, they're not really usable for a good part of the year because they're wet. So what we wanna do is improve the fields so that they really are a true community asset and resource. We will put a layer of drainage underneath them. We'll raise them by a foot so that you can utilize the fields year, year round or without the snow on them, I suppose, three, nine months out of the year. So we haven't fully um, vetted that conversation, but we wanted to be conservative in our costs and not come back to you later and say, oh, by the way. So those fields are included in the costs, uh, site costs associated with Fort River. So then for a new school on Fort River, um, our goal was to maximize the green space, provide as much outdoor learning and play space and recreation space. So we've developed a three-story option. We will continue to explore a three-story and a two-story option on the site um, to see what fits best educationally, what the costs are as well as how that impacts the site. Again, you'll see the dotted line to the north of the new school, that's the existing school. It will remain in operation while we're building the new school. And then once the new school is completed, the children move into it, we then will demolish the existing building and the foundations and then we'll need to fill, right? So again, you can see it, most or all of the site will be disturbed during construction. We've also identified an area for the geothermal field. And again, uh, the assumption is 80 to 100 wells at this point, but we'll continue to explore that. And we'll also continue to explore other net zero options such as um, the air source. So taking the same approach to the Wildwood site, um, again, very same, similar building. So we've just applied the same assumptions to the Wildwood School, demolishing the interior to uh, get daylighting into all of the core academic spaces in a two-story addition. As you can see, the site is much smaller. So there are no real play fields on it. They perhaps utilize the middle school's fields to the south. But we're able to identify a geothermal field. So that checks that it that you know we can say that yes, that's viable on this site. But we have more work to do on this site. Um, there's a conversation about potentially utilizing the Hawthorne site and how we may be able to um, benefit from use of that. There's a conversation about perhaps utilizing the field um, at the middle school recognizing that it's not under the full control of the town. So we'll have to kind of explore those options. And then we understand Office Strong Street that uh, this is the cemetery. There's a little sliver 
um, that's owned by the cemetery. And we were going to explore to see what the benefit might be if we were able to utilize that. But this is again, same kind of parameters um, to meet the educational needs, same amount of parking. As you can see, we do want to explore another means of uh, and um, egress on and off the site. We will look at the traffic and understand the um, implications of 575 students coming onto the site and where that impacts the neighboring main roads. We will have the same number of parking. We'll have place structures for both the lower grades, the upper grades. We'll have access around the entire building for um, the emergency vehicles. And again, as you can see, the entire site will most definitely be disturbed. So we will need to replace it or improve it or fix it when we're done. We looked at a three-story building again at the Wildwood site. Uh, we've actually identified a couple of locations for the geothermal fields and we'll again continue to vet this and see what makes the most sense. But we also want to make sure that we have the parking as close to the school as possible. So we've identified geothermal maybe to the west or to the left of the school and possibly on the uh, middle school field down below. We also want to look at possibly how can we benefit from nestling the school into the hill. Maybe there's benefits from a cost perspective, but what we need to be mindful of is that we, whatever gets built into the hill are not program spaces that require natural light, but we've done it before and it really can really um, be an attribute to the solution. And we'll also take a look at how we can best use the site as it relates to outdoor learning. We've, we've identified a small area here, but again, this is a test fit as well as play structures, gardens, and we want to make sure that we have full access around the building. Uh, Donna, there was a question from Tony Cunningham about where on the Wildwood site uh, we might anticipate the contractor lay down area would be. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, we will need to further explore that. Um, they may have to move several times. And so again, um, this is all very preliminary. I, I will say that, um, is this an eight acre site, Tim? It's approximately eight acres, a little more. It's 14 total, 14. probably 11 of it usable when you yeah. just count the, the slope to the right. So, so we have, design schools that have are um, probably close to that enrollment under for under two acres. So if, if um, th there are ways to achieve that, we haven't gotten to that level yet. We do need to look at, and thank you, Tony, for raising that. We do need to make sure whether it's new construction or renovation in addition, that it's critically important to main, maintain the safety and minimize the a disruption to the staff and students and the occupants of the, of the existing school while the construction is going on. So all of that will be studied in the upcoming um, months. Oh, I see one now. Ah, nice final size. Tony's, thank you, Tony. Does anyone have any questions before we get into the costing? Rudy, Brian, if you can unmute mute Rudy. How's that? Perfect. Okay. Um, I trust you guys have seen the Annie Fails uh, School because they did plunge part of the building into the slope, mm -hmm. uh, like windowless areas that I assume were mechanical rooms and that sort of thing seemed like was worth exploring. Um, I wondered if there's the possibility, if you do an ad reno of completing the new building first and then relocating uh, classes on a temporary crammed basis into the new building and then doing the phasing, is that just too tight on space? No. Uh no, no, that's a great observation, Rudy. And yes, it, it will be a phased approach. Um, we 
can, we will be kind of exploring at a high level how best to achieve this um, over the next several months. Yes, we would first um, build the addition and move the students into the addition, right? And then, and then kind of maybe the first, this part will be renovated and then you move those kids, these kids into this part. And so it's kind of gonna be like um, a game of chess a little bit. There may, <laughs> there, there may be um, some benefit. Uh, let's see, we're planning on going into construction in 2024. And at that point, maybe the sixth graders have been uh, relocated to the middle school. So that might allow a couple of classrooms. So we've already started thinking about this. Um, we, we do do complicated phased occupied renovation additions. Um, everyone is different and they all have their own sets of challenges. But you know, we're, we're very aware of the moving pieces that need to occur. We are saying right now that it is going to take longer because we can only do portions of it at a time because we don't have any other uh, swing space for the students. And that would apply both to Fort River and Wildwood. But we, we, we are familiar with the fail school and uh, Danisco ourselves have done many buildings where we've taken advantage of the topography and when appropriate, if it makes the most sense and working with uh, the public safety officials, if they're comfortable with not having you know, a full access around the building, we, we absolutely have taken advantage of the topography as well. And there, there are some benefits. There are a lot of benefits to that. It just has to be the appropriate spaces, like you said. Can I ask or make one more comment? Yeah, please? sure. Um, especially after our COVID lessons, um, I'm wondering if we can plan for more outdoor classes that have canopies over them and also power in the columns and lighting so that, you know, they could be used the bulk of the year maybe um, and give you sort of more flexible spaces, project areas, and you wouldn't obviously have to heat them or ventilate them. So there'd be an energy advantage and sort of be capturing some half cost space maybe. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And, and actually what we have been doing for, I guess I'll say several, gonna, maybe even longer, is we actually even put wireless access points on the outside of the buildings uh, cool. now, right? So, so that the classroom goes wherever you are. Um, we have to be careful about um, creating canopies and structures that are, are um, sufficient because they'll be permanent structures. So there may be some unintended costs associated with that, but it may be absolutely worth it. So we will continue to explore that. We always understand that um, it's great to be in the sun and being outdoors, but shade is also important. So, so we will absolutely take a look at that. I, I myself drive by all the schools in my town and I see those big white tents everywhere, but you see that they come down, right? Because you can't have them up in, in the winter. So we would have right. to design something that's a permanent structure, but yes, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have a comment question in the chat from Pam Rooney. Um, she's just saying she's not sure why the goal is to have parking as close as possible to the building in reference to the all new at Wildwood and saying you could have a larger area not separated from parking of green space from the building. Um, and I don't know if you want to handle this. Go right. for it. Yeah. Um, you know, as Don has said, these are preliminary and these are just the pieces in their order of magnitude size that we are moving around on the board to make sure that they fit, um, you know, the, the exact location, shape, function of the parking will be maximized to get obviously some spaces as close to the building and we want it to be convenient for everybody, but we also want green space to be as large and as close to the building as possible. And just to reiterate uh, the what is shown to the left of the building on this slide, the geothermal field will be completely usable as a play field with no apparent uh, machinery, anything related to geothermal apparent to a person using the space. We do have certain requirements um, from an accessibility perspective, obviously, to provide certain spaces. 
um, within 200 feet of the building. But, you know, your point is, to, and we look at the site too, and we're like, huh, how can we design this differently, right? But the, the challenge is we have the existing building that needs to remain um, in operation. So we need to start really looking at this and we totally agree with your comment. So uh, we'll have to spend some time, again, balancing all of the needs of the school. So thank you for that observation. Do you guys see any, any more comments in the chat? I have nothing else. Okay. So as you can see, we developed alternatives, test fits to see what's possible from a site and an educational program. Those four, you know, we, we check those boxes. So now what we need to do is just take order of magnitude costs for cost comparisons. These are relative costs to determine if any alternatives are not viable. So again, very preliminary we had to make certain assumptions and we'll continue to vet these with the building committee, with the town, with the officials, that the same square footage will um, for both renovation and addition alternatives at Wildwood and Fort River, the same building square footage for both new construction alternatives. And then we had to make conservative cost assumptions based on current market for public schools. So Danisco has been doing this since 1978, not me personally, but Danisco. Um, and, and we know the school market, but more importantly, our cost estimator, A.M. Fogarty, has also been doing this for probably as long. And they're actually, I think Margaret mentioned, that they're on every MSBA project, whether it's as the OPM, because they'll have their own cost estimator, or the designers team, that they understand the public school market, right? It's publicly bid. We have to understand all of the uh, state requirements for public bidding. But more importantly, there are fundamental basis of designs that go into every building. They need to be durable. They need to um, have a longevity of 50 plus years. We understand a lot of, and most schools, even though they may look a little different, really all have very similar features in them. So working with A.M. Fogarty, with our understanding and knowledge, as well as his, understanding where preliminary design, again, just relative costs, we were conservative with our numbers, but we don't think we're way off the mark, but we, we certainly don't want to be in a position where we underestimate now and have to come back to you in three months to say, oh, we need a little more. And then especially when we enter into schematic design and arrive at a um, project funding agreement with MSBA. And at that point, you need to um, ask the voters and community to support the project. We do not like to have a low up cost at the very beginning, and then it incrementally increases. We really have a great track record of presenting a cost now that really does not fluctuate much at all, unless scope drastically changes through, um, through actually through the end of the project. But anyway, so these conservative costs are, are based on current market for um, public schools in Massachusetts. We also understand the net zero bylaw and, and we're thrilled um, to be part of this very important project. So right now uh, we understand the goal of 25 EUI. So that's energy use index. And that will be a, a great target to achieve. And how do you achieve that? Well, we have to assume it has to be obviously non-fossil fuels. So it's either geothermal, which is ground source heat or air source. And so ground, the geothermal is a little more efficient, but it also has a little more upfront costs. 
but we're going to continue to explore that. The upfront costs may be offset by the um, usage and or what your PVs will be able to generate. So we're going to do a life cycle cost analysis to demonstrate what the actual payback is over time and what the benefits are of both the ground source and the air source um, to achieve your net zero. And then it also includes canopies, uh, solar canopies over the parking lot, and then uh, can and PV on the roof, solar on the roof. The other, the other components, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Fort River specific site impacts. One is just that it's significantly larger as we all saw. So that has just inherent costs associated with it. We've added a layer of soil to address the high water table. And then again, as I mentioned, the existing fields are to be replaced in kind with improved drainage. We do have a pretty good understanding of the sites and the site attributes. We haven't fully vetted the sites, but we have a really good basis of understanding for the sites. So we had to look at the cost comparisons for all of the options. And, and I kind of apologize for the noise of the 165 student option, but it's required for MSBA. So we're just sh sharing with you what we'll be submitting as part of the uh, PDP to MSBA. So I'll first start to say, understanding that there are options to be evaluated and explore, which is a phased occupied renovation and addition. There are two methods for construction. One is CM at risk or chapter 149A. And that allows us to engage and select a construction manager before we go out to bid. So they're part of our team. They'll work with us to um, help us with the best facing, constructability, how we can ensure the safety and the, minim the least amount of disruption for staff. And we find them extremely beneficial and especially for a renovation and addition options. So to compare apples to apples, what we've demonstrated here is that we're applying a CM at risk construction method across all of the options. So the first, you know, uh, I'll, if, if it's okay, if you have questions, uh, I'll slow down, but the Fort Riverside for 165 students, MSBA is asking us uh, to identify what the actual costs were just to repair the building, right? Uh, fix the equipment, um, bring the building up to code. What would that cost just as a baseline? So when we run through it, we have, um, we have direct costs or what we call subcontractor work. And then we have the CM or the general contractor has markups and those markups will include general conditions, general requirements. It includes escalation because we're not gonna be bidding this until 2024, it will be here soon enough. Um, it also includes some designer contingencies and some CM contingencies. It includes some payment and performance bonds and some other things. But as you can see, it's not in, insignificant to the cost. So the total construction cost is, I'm just going to round up, approximately $40 million. And then what we have um, identified for the repair only is we said, well, we're, if it's just a repair, it will not be a net zero facility because we're just repairing it. So we did not apply PVs, geothermal, or even a percentage for art. When we get into the renovation and addition for 165 students, um, it's going to be approximately 80,000 square feet. It might be slightly less based on uh, last night's vote, but it's order of magnitude truly. So again, uh, there's gonna be a demolition because we wanna make sure that all of the students have daylighting and views. So we'll be having to take a portion of the um, core of the building. Hazardous materials is really asbestos containing materials, lead paint, things like that, that need just to be demolished and treated and disposed of differently. That comes with a number and then your site work. Seeing it's gonna be a renovation addition, we're treating this as if it's going to be a school that needs site improvement. So we've incorporated those costs. 
again, by the time you add up the contractor markups, your total construction cost is, you know, approximately 53 million. And at this point, it's an investment you've made in the building. The building will remain with you for an extra 50 years. So now it's time to apply your initiatives such as the PVs, geothermal, and your um, percent for art. And then we did the exact same thing for a new school for 165 students. So just that's for MSBA really to benchmark, okay, what would it cost if this was only for the Fort River School and not combining the Fort River and Wildwood. And as you can see, there's really no benefit. You're, you're expending an enormous amount of capital to benefit 165 students. So then we wanna look at the Fort River, um, the 575 student and the four options that we've just presented. Again, the same building um, for both the Fort River and the Wildwood sites at 108,000 for renovation. The addition, again, everything being equal, uh, we have a cost for addition, a cost for the renovation. Uh, we have no new constructions considered addition at this point. The demolition, there's portions of the building that we're going to need to demolish to put the addition on. And then, of course, the hazardous materials that I just spoke of, the um, ACM, the um, asbestos containing materials and lead paint and the like. And then, as I mentioned, the site work at Fort River is larger um, than Wildwood. And for all of those reasons that I've stated, replacing in kind all of the disturbed areas, improving upon the um, soil so that you may utilize these um, town resources uh, more frequently. And then again, it has two drives. It's just a larger site. So by the time you put together the direct costs or the subcontractor costs with the contractor markups, it's approximately $72 million. We incorporate the PVs. The reason we have the um, PVs separate from the number as, under construction, it, it will be part of the project, but it's our recommendation at this point, and maybe things will change in a year or two, is to procure the PV separate from the CM project. And we say that because they are, it's a specialty and the general, uh, the construction manager is gonna go and hire the same people and then put their markups on it. So what we're saying is, well, that's not really great use of town money that we can just have a separate contract with a company that does uh, photovoltaics independent of the contractor or the uh, construction manager, but it would be part of the project. It will come after we finish the site because we, we need to have them in the parking lot. So they normally come in after the site is complete, but it would be part of the project. Again, I've talked about the geothermal costs and then the percent for art. So a renovation addition at Fort River, again, very rough order magnitude of approximately $78 million for construction, for renovation addition. For new construction, um, pre pretty similar costs, 47 versus 50 million. Some differences here is that we'll be demolishing the entire building, not just portions of it. And uh, the site is a little bit more because we have a little more found, um, we'll need a little more site work done to support the foundations. So there's a slight increase in those costs. So you can see it's 72 million versus 74, more importantly, including the PVs and geothermal and percent for art, it's 78 million versus 80 million. And at Wildwood, again, applying the same basis of design for the building, the demolition remains the same. The buildings are um, identical. There's a little bit more for hazardous material disposal. There's more um, asbestos containing material. I think it's in the flooring tiles. They're safe now, but when you remove them, you have to just treat them differently. So there's a little more cost there, but you can see that the site costs are less. And again, for the reasons I just said why Fort River was more, is it's a much smaller site there's not a whole lot more replication of fields. You don't have fields on the site. So um, 
that's why the site at Wildwood is less. Again, you add in the PVs, the geothermal and the percent for art, you know, there's somewhere around 75 million um, compared to 76.7 million for a new construction. So that's the construction aspect of the project. So when you add them all up, this is the costs coming across for total construction. Then there's what's called project costs. And that is approximately 25% of the construction. It's a multiplier of 1.25 of the construction cost. What does that include? It includes the OPM designer fees, all of the town agency reviews, whether, whether we have um, wetlands that we have to go before conservation commission, depending on the site, there may be some other um, town agencies that we have to go before. We have hazardous material abatement oversight. That's um, an added cost that goes into the what's called soft costs, utility fees. More importantly, where you're gonna see a lot of the money is under furniture and equipment and technology. Um, if there's a way to reduce those costs, we haven't even started that and reuse some of your furniture and equipment, that would be great. But um, you know, this is assuming um, that's part of the 25% or 1.25 markup, including technology moving there, believe it or not, even if it's just to the building, eight feet, 10 feet to the south, there's moving costs associated with that. And then there are contingencies, the owner's contingency, construction contingency. And there's actually quite a bit of money required for construction testing to make sure that um, it's a controlled site. So we have to make sure that the testing is done for structural, for soils, for geothermal, for demolition. So all of this um, all adds up to approximately 25% or a multiplier of 1.25% of the total of the construction costs. So when you look at the bottom line, you know, our, our base repair, which actually could be applied, whether it's 165 students or 575 students is approximately 50 million. And then we look at the costs as it relates to the 575 student options of 97.7, to 100 million, over 100 million for um, a new construction on Fort River. And Wildwood is uh, 93.7 million for a renovation addition and 95.9 .9 or 96 million for new construction. But that's not the end of the story as it relates to um, options for construction. I had mentioned there's two delivery methods. One's the CM, and we find that absolutely invaluable if it's going to be a renovation addition, especially in an occupied school. However, the other, another way for construction is called design bid build, which is chapter 149 versus chapter 149A. And this is our traditional, we design it, we bid it, we get a hard bid, and the contractor goes and builds it. And we've been doing this for years. Um, this has been the method that Massachusetts has used for, for many years for public construction projects. We believe that uh, a design bid build is absolutely appropriate for new construction, even if it's on an existing, on a site that has a school on it. We do it all the time. There's um, the same oversight from our firm, from Margaret's firm, and we know that it can be done safely and efficiently as it would be with the CM. There is inherent savings with a hard bid rather than a CM and a Margaret will be spending time over probably the next month or so with the building committee, really diving into the true differences, but working with AM Fogarty, our cost estimator, we believe that there is actually quite a bit of savings as it relates to new construction going with a design bid build option for construction method rather than a CM. So that is one component to consider when we're weighing all the options, a renovation in addition versus new construction. But 
this is certainly a way to reduce some of those costs if the education and the site all also check the box, right? It's not always just about cost, but we know that's a huge component of the decision that we make in a couple, in three months, four months at the end of June. So I will pause there. Um, and I would be surprised if no one has any comments about the cost. Rudy. I think Brian has to unmute you, Rudy, one sec. How's there that? you go, perfect. Uh, somebody asked me, and I didn't know the answer to this, The C, because I, I never was really involved in a CMR contract when I was doing this kind of thing. Um, does the CMR uh, approach transfer some of the risk of cost overrun to the contractor, or are we still on the hook for unexpected construction costs that come up? So I'll, I'll maybe say like a what's little risk? What's the risk? What's the risk in the well, CMR? Yeah, well, that, that's the question some of us ask on a daily basis. So, so in pu public construction, um, as, as opposed to perhaps developer construction and, and the public and the private contract uh, world, construction world, if there is something that is not on the drawings, whether it's CM or hard bid, that would be a change order, right? So it doesn't matter which way. So there really is no, the, the exposure um, to the town would be equal if there was something that was missed on the contract drawings. I don't know, Margaret, I, I'm just trying to simplify because I know we have a lot of, you want to talk? Brian, can you unmute Margaret, please? Margaret, see if you can unmute yourself. You should be able to, there you go. Yeah, Rudy, it's a great question. And I, I wanna reiterate what D Donna said, which is we're really gonna dig into this in the next phase of the project and have some public discussion about it. But the, I think the, the thing that raises people's interest is that the, um, the, the form of contract is called construction manager at risk for the CMAR. Um, and they are, there is some risk. I, I would say a, a better way of thinking about the kind of big picture difference between the two contracts is that um, in a CM contract, you have um, a transparent contingency number, which can be used for um, things that come up during construction. So it can be things that were missed either by the designer or by the contractor, um, but it's it's transparently managed. And so in um, in a and you also transparently see the profit that is being made in a general contract. Um, it is sort of in it's a lump sum contract, and so you know it. Uh, sometimes I think that the preferences for the two types of contracts are a little bit of a Rorschach test for your personality, because you know, if, you, if you're really interested in the transparency of uh, construction contracts, you will be drawn to a CM contract. And if you're really interested, if you'd sort of prefer it be a lump sum and let the contractor um, sort of make what they make, then you, the design bid build feels better. And, and Donna is correct that generally, for new construction, design bid build um, is is a better deal. You sort of a it tends to be a little more competitive market, but um, it it's that's a very high level, very unnuanced <laughs> answer to your question. And we will talk more about it in the next phase. So I, um, there was one question um, in design, how are spaces for quiet and 
those for use for more energetic activity considered? How is a desk and other classroom layouts considered for optimal physical comfort of students? Um, thank you for asking that question. We will be spending quite a bit of time um, over both um, the next part of the preferred schematic report or the study phase, but more importantly, during the schematic design phase and how we lay out the classrooms and what the features are, how, they how, how furniture may shape the classrooms and how we can right, optimize um, the physical comfort of the students. We've learned so much over the last few couple of years um, regarding COVID and the separation, but yet everyone still wants to be together. So it's called flexibility, but we need to spend time working with the uh, school department on how best that may feel for Amherst. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I know Chris Riddle had his hand up. And then Bruce Coleman. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Chris. Uh, I just three or four questions. Um, <clears throat> can you, uh, can, can, I believe you said this before, uh, the renovated, if we do um, add reno, that the renovated portions will be taken to the same EUI, the same performance standards as the new construction. Did I hear that right? Correct. Um, um, is it possible? Is any? I imagine some people have thought about this to have to put this Wildwood students somewhere in the middle school while we work on the building, as as a like a, maybe there's more capacity in the in middle school that could maybe take the whole school for a year. No. That's a question, not for you, Donna. I think that's for, for the school committee. Um, and, um, two more questions. Um, uh, we, we talked about moving the, where, the geothermal line item up and amongst, uh, against, along with basic construction. It, it is, it is, it's confusing to see it sort of below the line like that because uh, people will tend to think it's a it's a, um, a renewable resource, but it isn't in terms of the zoning bylaw. In terms of the zero energy bylaw. Lastly, um, could we the carry could we budget the public playing fields, the outdoor playing fields that have to be uh, rebuilt in at Fort River, in and a separate line item that would not uh, make. Uh, it would tend to make the Fort River project look actually be equal to the Wildwood site. Um, so can we, um, I think it's deceptive to see the, um, I'm sorry, um, the, the playing fields are really a separate but uh, town budgeted uh, item and uh, can we carry it separately so it doesn't make everything look so expensive. That's Thank all you. I have. Thank you. Um Mike, why, why don't you go ahead mm -hmm. first? Yeah, so I'll just I'll respond to the question about the middle school. With the sixth grade going to the middle school in a year and a half, um, there wouldn't be space for it to be more swing space because it's already increasing by you know roughly a quarter, uh, a little more, between a quarter and a third of the students that currently are there. So we lose that flexibility. Um, you know, And Donna and the team will respond about the fields. It's not my area of expertise, but I do know that um, we currently do struggle with wet fields uh, at Fort River on a routine basis. And so where it goes and how it's paid for is, uh, is a good question for the town and for others to weigh in on. My only interest is that we have usable fields for students, uh, including in the spring and the fall with the rain and with the snow melting. Um, so how that all plays out, not my uh, area of expertise. My only interest is that students have uh, actively have fields that don't need to be high quality high school fields, but they do need to be dry uh, or dry enough for, for physical activity. But with that, I'll turn, I see uh, other people have their hands up, like Kathy and, and Donna may want to jump in on this. Yeah, I, I just, just again, to respond to the fields, um, you know, the contractor, CM, whatever, the construction is, is pretty much going to disturb most of the site. So if you can see this, um, there's, there's no way to not 
disturb the fields or not disturb most of the fields during construction. Here's the existing building. Obviously, we're going to have to replace that. We're going to have to obviously demolish and then fill it. And then the new school will be going where some of the fields are, right? And then we are going to require contractor lay down space. And so we'll have to just um, figure out how to do that. But that conversation can occur and I see Kathy's hand, so she might have something else to offer. But right now uh, we felt it was the responsible thing to do was to bring it up and identify it as a site attribute and a community resource and that we should at minimum just replace in kind, but we can continue to have that conversation. Kathy. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what uh, Donna just said, Chris. Um, the building committee is aware of this as part of the current costs. And I think one of the things you're seeing is um, they've priced it conservatively, like this is the maximum. We could decide that we're just not gonna replace the fields. Um, we have to uh, do something on the repair and replace them. Or we could see um, whether the town wants to finance that separately. So one of the things we'll be asking is separate estimates on this. And I think it's we're at a preliminary stage and it's good to have this as a total. But yes, we will be getting how much of this is the fact that the building itself has to be protected. We don't want water running into the building. Um, so some of it is raising the field um, to deal with wetlands. And remember, this is Fort River with where the water table is an issue and there's also wastewater management on it. So we're gonna get, we don't have that detail yet, but we will be getting it. And so these are not final numbers is the other thing that I really would urge people to think about. Right, um, Kathy, thank you. Just just one clarification. Um, it's not wastewater, it's stormwater. Yes, I meant we have to. So, I meant, so, yeah, 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 because again, conservation areas and we have, um, I don't wanna say restrictions, but there are aspects of the site that we're gonna have to treat the stormwater runoff and uh, a responsible manner, as well as be aware that it is a high water table. But that, you know, we feel that that isn't a significant cost, but yes, there will be disturbance to the site. Um, I, I think, uh, Chris, I think we answered all of your questions and just to reiterate the renovation. Um, yeah. Well, the question about the, the geo, geothermal Geothermal line items should be above the line rather than below the line. It's part of the construction project. Yes, thank you. And um, we received that feedback. So we'll, we'll um, at the next phase, as we go through the options for um, net zero, we'll make sure that we may have two, you know, construction options side by side with the different uh, net zero right. options. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, Bruce Coleman? Yeah. Uh, oh, I can't. You're there. Oh, am I? Yes. Am I, oh, I am. Okay. And we I don't, don't see seem to be you, able to. But... No, I, I'm, trying <laughs> to okay. I'm, I'm trying to push my little button. It's not working, but I'll, we'll go. Two comments on the question. First, uh, I do actually agree with Chris about the, uh, the, the cost of the uh, fields uh, at Fort River. As he's not questioning the cost, just the, the display of it. And I think uh, if you're getting substantially more playing fields in one of the scenarios as opposed to the other, it would be good to make the apples and apples comparison between the two schools by by showing the difference of expense uh, is, is partly because of there's more there in one of them than there is in the other. Uh, second, and I'll probably have much more to say of this uh, as time goes by vis-a-vis -vis the CM at risk versus bid, I know in all of my practice years for 30 years, starting in the early 90s, I always worked with CM at risk. It was partly because we were doing rather innovative and, and, and somewhat risky projects. And uh, the idea of getting the constructor in the, the room early um, avoided this odious process of what is called value engineering, which is a a ridiculous term in my view it's 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 just design and it design ought to be done when design is done not after you've bid the process and then go over it again so the cm at risk really uh, uh safeguards against the possible likelihood of that this 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 awful business of value engineering but more on that 
later, I think. But that's the, that's you'll hear you'll you'll hear me, you'll hear me expand on that argument to the extent necessary as time goes by. I think uh, the question um, I think I understand from previous uh, um, uh, meetings and so forth that uh, another item that is typically in the twenty five percent surcharge over the construction cost is commissioning. Um, but I think I understand that there will be commissioning, but we are not paying for it. And that uh, so that uh, that 25% is not covering commissioning, but it doesn't mean it won't be done. I believe it's being paid for by the MSBA directly. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, the, they, <laughs> yes, uh, res re resonating. Um, the, the one it, they do all of the commissioning for the building, the envelope, the systems, um, that, that is 100% paid for by MSBA. And the commissioning agent is on, they come on board during design development. So actually it's, they're one, it's great to have them as part of the team during design as well. It's very gratifying to hear that. Mm. I, I wanted everybody else they do, to do some keep nice things. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I, can't, I can't unmute. You can't mute. Oh, hold That's on. Okay. Right That's okay. That's okay. Um, I, I, uh, Chris, and then I have a, a comment in the chat. Chris Riddle. Work. There it goes. Um, um, oh dear, this is awful. Um, I can't remember what it was. I'll go away. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, when you think of it, Chris, just let us know. Um, there was a question in the chat. Can you effectively change a high water table? Can you explain more? Um, I could, but I have experts here, Rick or Tim. Um, we will not be able to change the water table, but we will be able to raise the building above the water table, which it is now, the water table is slightly below the surface, or we will be able to improve the soil so that it drains better. Um, so, you know, to, to change the seasonal high water, average season, high, it, it is not the goal. The goal is to build the building in the way that we know how that the water cannot get through the subgrade that we put under it and exert hydrostatic pressure on the building. So one of the means is to put drainage around the building. Another is to um, create a porous layer below the building or to bring the building up. And water level underground is not perfectly flat. It mounds where there is water flowing, it's higher. And all of these means that we described and are in the basis of the general cost now, just control that and get the water away from the building. So I hope that answers the question. The short answer is we can't change it, but we can control how it interacts with the building. Chris, did you remember your question? I did. Awesome. Um, the, the ZE bylaw requires two commissioning events, one just before opening and one a year later. Is that, uh, have you, uh, is that inc included in this estimate? <clears throat> um, the before it opens would be the MSBA commissioning agent. Um, after it opens and a year later, I don't believe that has um, been incorporated, but thank you for pointing that out. We'll make sure that that fits within the soft costs. Um, Margaret, unless you think it is included, I don't, I don't believe MSBA yeah, they will come back. They, they don't come back, but, you know, there can also be um, typically, for instance, the MSBA commissioning um, does not include window testing. Um, you know, it, it, what they have is a kind of pretty standard package of stuff and it's, it's good and it's, it's free to the communities, but it's not unusual for there to be some additional scope. 
um, purchased from the commis commissioning agent. So we'll, we will look, it's a great question, Chris, we'll look at the full scope with those who are sort of interested in it and make sure that it is as complete as it needs to be for this community. Um, they will look into it. There, there may be what's called enhanced commissioning. So, but thank you for pointing that out. We'll make sure it's included, if not with MSBA, that it's included as part of the soft cost. And we'll make sure we understand what it is that they're commissioning when they're um, out there for the follow-up. I'm assuming part of it is to make sure that it's meeting the design intent after a year of being in service. Um, I see Rudy. Yeah, just to further complicate that issue, there's also a requirement in our bylaw to have a peer review of the energy modeling. So that's in section E of the bylaws, just worth taking a quick spin through those and making sure those are factored into your costs and, and timeline. And then um, somebody asked me this question. It sounds like it could be complicated, but I thought it was an interesting question theoretically. Um, if the geothermal field, if Wildwood is the site and the geothermal fields end up on the middle school ground, is there any possibility for economies of scale of allowing that geothermal field, like making a bigger one and having it take care of the middle school? Or is that just too hard to connect those systems and too much complication in, in the project then? Um, well, I'll say uh, first, that's that's a very creative approach, right? And and I love that you're, you're thinking about how to- Somebody else, it was somebody else's building. great idea, not mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you to whomever. Um, yeah. I, I, just a little bit of complication on that really would be the middle school is not 100% owned by the, um, or part of Amherst, right? It's the regional right. school. Right. So we would need to go through that process and MSBA wouldn't pay for, not that um, we will probably exceed their costs, their construction costs, but um, if you're if you're doing something above and beyond, uh, you know, MSB, I wouldn't participate in it. But I, I need to say that with a caveat that MSBA um, participates, but doesn't necessarily reimburse for what the construction costs are to date. So, um, Margaret, I don't know if you want it, but there's a different way to say that. But having MSBA involved just complicates things, I, I guess might be the simple answer to that. Which, you know, I think Donna is kind of an extension of what you were explaining earlier about the way these numbers have been shown. It, it, the intention is not to show the geotechnical as sort of separate, somehow separated from the project. It's to indicate that there are reasons that it may be contracted separately that have to do with um, where it is, have to do with the cap on the MSBA reimbursement and have to do with the sort of the best value way of procuring them. But it, it, it's still, but Rudy, as, as, um, as we look at not just this project, uh, you know, we should maybe at, at least give it a quick look to see if, um, how, how maybe providing geothermal wells uh, for the middle school, how, what would that look like, right? Just a quick test fit. Thanks. I don't see any other hands. Is there anyone else in chat team? I'm not getting all my chat notes. I have a question from Pam Rooney. Does the MSBA require a set aside of two to three percent of construction costs for future maintenance obligations? They do not. I've never heard that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is um, what where that may have come from is there is some additional reimbursement up to about two percent. 
um, for having a, an excellent maintenance plan. So um, we don't yet know what that reimbursement will look like for Amherst, um, but I did ask recently what the average was and it's about 1.4, 1.5. Mm. So I think you can, you know, given that your buildings have are have been well made, really well maintained. I think you can assume that there's about a one, maybe 1.4, 1.5% of additional uh, reimbursement. And that may be where that number is coming from, if I had to guess. But it's not, (laughs) it's not money set aside. It's sort of additional reimbursement in the reimbursement calculation. This is a quiet group tonight. Well, while maybe people are thinking, um, what we'll do is we'll just quickly talk about the next steps. Um, We will be going before the school building committee on Friday to vote to approve the PDP. And again, just to reiterate what they're approving, it would be for us to continue to evaluate a renovation and addition or new construction at either Wildwood or at Wildwood and Fort River um, based on the educational program and plan and square footage that was approved last night. Um, so we, they'll be voting on that and then we will be wrapping it up, putting a bow on it, sending it to MSBA by, by March 15th. And then the next steps are um, to continue to evaluate the um, alternative solutions, right? So now our focus, now that we've established the program and everything, we understand the buildings, we understand the sites, Now, over the next few months, we're going to evaluate the alternative solutions. Is Wildwood or Fort River, um, you know, a more preferable site? We're going to look at both as it relates to traffic, site, how how does the building sit on the site? How does the building respond to the best orientation um, of the building uh, and, and where it fits on the site? We're going to look at a renovation versus new construction, right? What um, the benefits, the pros and cons of both as it relates to the educational program, as it relates to construction duration and disruption, and as it relates to cost. And then we know it's gonna be a net zero building, but the question is, how do we get there? We know we can get there. We just wanna fully vet it and make sure that we meet, um, that we all can kind of come to consensus on what the best solution is for this project. So those, we're gonna be busy and and you're gonna, you know, individually and collectively hear from us uh, over the next three months. And then in June, uh, we will be bringing back a, and and prior to that, we'll be keeping you informed, we'll have further community forums, but in June, um, the town or building committee community uh, collectively would need to select a preferred solution to move forward. So Wildwood, Fort River, renovation, addition, new construction, right? So one of those solutions will rise to the top and that will be the preferred solution moving forward. They'll have a more informed cost estimate at that point. It will not be a final cost estimate. We still won't have all the information we need but hopefully it will, um, all the information that we're doing over the next few months will help inform the cost and hopefully, or at least we'll fine tune it or feel good about, feel a little bit better about the cost. We will be submitting the preferred schematic report um, to MSBA, June 27th, that's a hard deadline. Uh, It is a requirement. MSBA then takes uh, two months to look at our, submission and then the MSBA board of directors uh, will vote on it uh, August 31st to also agree and accept what the preferred solution is. And then and then we can get into schematic design. So June 27th is our next major milestone. And as we start moving forward with you know, our true evaluation of these remaining four options, We'll be back with additional information as, as we start to um, uncover all of the options. 
Margaret or Kathy. I still don't. Oh, Chris. Chris Riddle, did you disappear on me? I don't see any hands up. Oh, that's weird. Okay. I don't see any hands I'm up. sorry. That, that was that was an erroneous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that means, it did not mean to interrupt you. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I'm glad we're interacting. Um, so if so, Donna, you're not seeing any more in chat room or questions. So then I, I Tim, Brian, do you see anything? No. Yes. Okay. Okay. So then maybe you can go to the next slide. Um, I think you have one more. Okay. So um, um, Don is turning it back to me. I opened it and I'll close it. Um, as I said, I'm the chair of the building committee. We will be meeting and there's several building committee members who have been listening to tonight. Um, we will be meeting on Friday at 830 in the morning. We'll be reviewing a very large package, but there really is only one part of it we'll be focused on, which is to approve going forward with these four alternatives and to agree that we're not going to go forward with 165 uh, person school. Um, so we'll be taking two motions on that. The rest of a very long package will be the hazmat report, the traffic study report, the building condition report. The, so it gets very thick because, and I believe Margaret said she's even going back and getting all the minutes of every mm -hmm. committee meeting. <laughs> and, you know, so we have, um, just so people know, we were comparing how often we've met um, whether it's the school committee forums, this, and we are uh, many multiple times more than the last project because there's been a real attempt to be transparent. And so as we go through to the next very intense phase for the building committee, which I find incredibly exciting because we're going to be looking at not just test fits, but more what does fit and making choices, um, we will be coming to back to the community before we make a decision. And so that it will be informed decision to get down to the preferred. The school committee meeting last night, uh, one of the members said, we've just done our job, which was the education program, which will be in this large packet, along with the space that they voted on. Now the action goes over to the building committee, but that doesn't mean we're doing it alone. We're really going to be doing it with getting input from people. And I'm delighted at the input we've been getting. One more thing is to remember the website that we put up. There's some initial frequently asked questions and answers. Since we've been getting more questions and have been supplying more answers, we're also gonna be updating that part of the website so that people can see, has anyone asked this? What kind of answer, where, where are we in this process? So we're gonna be trying to keep that um, question and answer up and running. And we are posting the videos of the community forum for anyone who wants, who didn't get to come tonight who wants to look at the discussion as well as the materials. So I, I am really excited and I'm stunned with the patience and the care that our design team and our OPM have put into this where they're always willing to respond to good questions. Um, and we learn something every time. I learn something every time. So I we to, learn something every time. So <laughs> I do. I, so it's great. So I just want to thank everybody. I, I know a lot of people in the audience have put in a lot of time too. And um, we both, we highly value it and we hope you stay involved. So I think we're done unless I yeah. see any other comments. So thank you very much. Thank you all very much. And we will be in touch and be reaching out to everyone. Um, so stay informed, stay connected. I'm sure you all know where to go. Get involved. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.